Well, welcome everybody um, to OpenShift Commons. Uh, we're streaming live on both BlueJeans and Twitch, so wherever you are, uh, welcome. Um, we are now um, going to have a great talk. I always love hearing from Mark Borstein from um, Tremolo Securities, one of my favorite um, Commons members and one of the earliest members to the, the Commons. Um, and today he's going to talk a little bit about um, a little bit, hopefully, a lot about securing your your pipelines on OpenShift, and and I really like this uh, this whole topic. We've been talking a lot lately about DevSecOps and how to keep the conversations going and keep everybody happy. So I'm going to let Mark introduce himself. We're going to do probably 20, 30 minutes, maybe, right, Mark? About that much uh, with the demo. We'll see how we. Can. Yeah, we got uh, we got slides. We only have about seven hundred slides or so. Oh, just I, um, <laughs> I told you. No, but we have a really fun demo. That that that's yeah. We want to get right. into the tech and make sure has folks have fun uh, uh, seeing what we're up to and and maybe get some ideas going on what they can do in their own projects. Yeah, and then we'll basically have a conversation with everybody who's online and and um, AMA stylish, and I'm going to pick uh, Mark's brains a little bit afterwards and if you have questions just enter them in the chat either in the uh, the ones on twitch or the ones here in um, blue jeans and um, we'll just have a conversation for the the second half hour so mark with that intro please take it away introduce tremolo security and yourself and um, tell us how to secure our pipelines thanks diane and uh, thank you again for giving us a chance to uh, come on to commons and talk um so we're going to be talking, like like Diane said, about securing your pipeline. So we're not going to be talking about what your pipeline should be so much as how do you provision your pipelines? How do you create your pipelines in your enterprise? How do you uh, figure out where it goes, how the different things connect? So who are we? Uh, we were founded in 2010. We're, we're focused on identity management, and, and we'll talk about why identity management and pipelines uh, kind of intersect there. 100% uh, open source, so what we're about to show you is, you know, and, and there's a link in the Blue Chains chat, uh, all open source, so all freely available. Uh, we've been working with OpenShift since 2015. Um, I'm rocking a little bit of my retro OpenShift gear here uh, from before it was built on Kubernetes. Uh, so we've got a lot of experience in the space, uh, and, you know, we were in the first class of the certified containers for Red Hat. First class of the certified operators, proud to have been included in the uh, first round of the marketplace offering that just came out uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, so we're, we're pretty well steeped inside of uh, uh, the Red Hat culture um, and, and product ecosystem. Uh, I myself have been working with Kubernetes since you know, about 2015. Um, uh, uh, CK, uh, as of uh, uh, several months ago. Um, so it, it's not unusual to see me uh, either in the OpenShift Commons Slack or in the Kubernetes Slack answering whatever questions folks have around identity management, authentication, et cetera. Uh, but we're not actually gonna talk a lot about authentication today. Uh, we're gonna talk about pipelines and we're gonna talk about it not just from a technical perspective, but from a stakeholder perspective, a user perspective, a DevSecOps perspective, the three parts of that, that word. You know, the developer, right? I'm a developer, I wanna write code. You know, I, I, I really, if it gets in the way of me writing code, yeah, I'm not happy about it, right? You know, we, we as vendors, we as a community spend a lot of time trying to make this experience really good and really working on the user experience here. Uh, I, you know, maybe I know what YAML is, maybe I don't. Uh, a lot of times I don't want to know how the stuff gets deployed. I just want to be able to work on my thing. I like get, write the code, push it onto the next task. So, um, you know, developers, they're, they're generally focused on making sure that that business logic, you know, the thing that runs your company, your enterprise is, is being built. And then the op side of it, right, our administrators. Um, raise your hand if you've ever gotten a nervous tick from hearing Slack go off. Uh, I know I have, um, you know, and, and as an administrator, you help somebody and uh, your reward for that is they ask you every single time they need something, no matter uh, what it is. And, and so, uh, you know, the, the, you're, you're not just the, the person who fixes things, now you're the person who has to 
figure out how you get people to not ask you to do things personally. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of, you know, ad hoc work that has to be done no matter what it is. And then finally, uh, you know, you get into that audit perspective of, you know, you've been working on a system for a year or two, and then all of a sudden this person comes in and says, hey, is this secure? Why do these people have access to these systems? Um, sometimes with a little more structure, sometimes with less. I know I've had one customer who literally just, the auditor sent me an email and said, hey, is this secure? And I was like, sure. Um, and so, uh, uh, you know, ops kind of makes all that run often in the background. And, and, and so you, you got to respect what they're doing. And then sex security. Uh, yeah, the security person, they're looking to understand why. That's the biggest question. Why are all these projects here? Uh, who approved the access to it? Um, you know, we've made it so easy through, through OpenShift and, and API-driven infrastructure to be able to do things that the, the, the previous concepts of privileged access versus regular access kind of go away. So now kind of everything is privileged. If I can deploy new code just by pushing it into a repo, I should probably have multi-factor access on that repo. Um, so so there, there are questions there. Uh, you know, and just because we're doing this whole cloud native thing and everything's automated doesn't mean that we don't still have compliance rules that we have to work around. Uh, you know, and, and there's this argument of compliance for security, but at the end of the day, if the law says you have to be compliant in these areas, there's not a lot of an argument. Um, and so when we look at the provisioning process and integrating these three things and, and you know, was so often called the culture of DevOps and DevSecOps, it's not that any one of these is more important than the other. They all need to work together in harmony. And so any solution really needs to focus on all three, not just one or two of those components. So why is identity management important in all this? Uh, you know, let's talk about the pipeline. What does your pipeline look at? So we're going to do a demo of a proof of concept we were asked to do for a customer where the pipeline was more than just OpenShift. OpenShift was that starting point. They had a lot of legacy Jenkins workloads. They wanted to continue to leverage Jenkins for, for their builds. They wanted to use GitLab. They wanted to show that we could integrate with SonarCube for scanning. Now, the interesting thing about all three of these, they have their own authentication process, and they all have their own identity management system. You know, Jenkins, it ships with OpenShift. It's tightly integrated, so that works really well. GitLab has its own identity management system, right? It's got its own API, its own way of integrating with groups. You know, there's SSO, sure, but you still have to provision those different things. And then SonarCube as well has its own thing. So every application that makes up your pipeline, it's going to be more than just OpenShift. It'll be, you know, at least three things here, right? A CI CD pipeline of some kind, uh, you know, source control, different kinds of scanners. You might have different types of process-based applications. Um, so, so your pipeline is going to be more than just OpenShift. You, OpenShift is your starting point. Uh, and so one of the interesting things that came out of, of when we first started getting into OpenShift uh, and Kubernetes in general was we found that the identity management workflow engine was actually kind of a nice automation engine as well, as long as we had an API to talk to. Uh, it gave you a single path so you could actually trace when a request was made, who approved the request, what objects were created throughout your, your infrastructure. Everything was tied together. Uh, it gave you an approval process. Uh, you know, uh, why is something being done that needs to be approved of? Who has access that needs to be approved of? Uh, you could do that in external systems, uh, but a lot of CI CD systems, they, they don't have this part of it. It's mostly focused on, um, on, on the process and less the approval. You've got some stuff with Git and whatnot, uh, but I haven't seen it as integrated as this. Uh, and then there's an automation side of it where um, you want to do things the same way every single time as much as possible. You always have exceptions. You always have to have flexibility. But, you know, you want to have your base be 
okay, it, unless you have a really good reason, we want you to stay within this process. And, and that process is gonna vary between, uh, between enterprises. So we found that there was a really nice meld there between identity management, both between tying the various pieces of your pipeline together and being able to um, uh, track your pipeline and the provisioning process. Let's talk a little bit about the demo. Everybody wants to have fun with the demo. I like demos. Um, so what we've built today is a, uh, a multi-environment OCP pipeline. So we've got two OCP environments. Uh, we've got a development and we've got a production. All of our uh, applications for managing the pipeline actually run in our development, uh, our development uh, uh, OCP. So we have GitLab running in here. We have SonarCube. We have Jenkins. And this is where the, the bulk of the work goes. So the first thing that happens is when a user logs into OpenShift for the first time, they get their own sandbox. So, so a just-in-time built project the first time they log in. The second thing is they're able to request that a project get created. And when that project gets created, and we'll go through the details, there are a lot of different steps. You gotta create it in GitLab, you gotta create the project in OpenShift, you gotta create the project in the production OpenShift. Um, and there's a managerial process. So uh, we don't necessarily want developers or even admins to be running like OC commands or you know, doing anything like that to get the up and run. We'll automate that process. But then when the move goes into production, we want to leverage what OpenShift gives us. So you've got image streams and deployment configs that will intelligently roll out thing, you know, applications as updates get made. So we said, all right, when we do a rollout to production, that really means pushing a container from the development environment into the production. OpenShift has its own built-in registry, so all API driven. So I said, all right, let's go ahead and execute a API call in production. Let it pull the registry or the container from dev into production. That gives us that whole kind of circle of uh, the, the development life cycle. The other thing that becomes really important here, and we have our, our, our manager over here, is somebody needs to take responsibility for when rollouts happen. You can't just say, okay, I'm just gonna hit the button and be done with it. Um, and you know, uh, a lot of enterprises, the people who make those decisions don't generally wanna log into Git. Um, you know, they're, they're used to web applications and so get to them where they live. Uh, and so we provide them a UI to say, hey, somebody's requested that an application be pushed into production. Uh, that workflow in an enterprise will often have multiple steps because you'll have multiple stakeholders that have to sign off on it. Here we have just one step, but you know, it's all customizable. You hit go, it deploys, and then there's an audit log of not only what happened, but who approved it. So we'll go through that as well. So what you end up having is, is this um, uh, very, uh, um, life cycle approach to, to being able to to uh, deploy an application consistently into your environment. So let's talk about the dev pipeline that we'll see. Um, a lot of this is gonna happen behind the scenes, so uh, I, I like to go into the details before we hit the demo up. Uh, so I'm a developer, I'm doing my work, I merge into master. That's gonna kick off a pipeline that will do the build, do a code analysis, create a container, push it into the test environment. At that point, it's assumed that there is something that's gonna do some testing, whether it's automated. Um, there could be multiple layers of analysis. Here, we're just doing code analysis. Uh, in, in your pipelines, I would highly recommend things like uh, container, um, uh, scanning your containers for vulnerabilities, things of that nature. Um, so there could be all sorts of other uh, steps to the pipeline, depending on um, you know, the type of code it is, type of application, et cetera. Uh, but once it's in test, at that point, uh, we're doing our testing. That is our kind of goal for now before we push it into production. Then it's time for production. So somebody says, you know, the, the, the typical enterprise, forgetting OpenShift and Kubernetes for a moment, you know, your typical enterprise is going to be something to the effect of, you know, I'm ready to move my application into production. Let's go to the change control board or the, the control access board or you know whoever the people who are responsible because somebody's got to sign off on it. 
and you go in and you say, here's what I'm going to do. Here's my back out plan. Here's the, you know, he, here's the, the, um, the mitigations. Here are the risks. Here's who we think will be impacted. And that gives everybody who's a stakeholder a chance to say yes or no. We're okay. We're not okay. Um, and so here we're automating that process. We're saying, all right, somebody is going to log in, give a reason why they want to do the deployment, and it's going to go through a set of approvals. Once those approvals all clear, the uh, promotion to production is automated. We're going to push the container to production. It's actually not 100%. Accurate. We're going to pull the container from dev because uh, you don't want your dev environment to be able to push into production. So prod is going to pull the container from dev into its own image stream. And at that point, you're then leveraging OpenShift's built-in um, uh, built capabilities to recognize that the image stream has been updated and roll out new versions, how you define your deployment config. So what is a project? Uh, we talked a lot about that and, you know, about having a project, um, but there's just a lot of different steps you got to go through to make it work. You got to create the project in dev, the project in production. You got to create something in GitLab. You got to create all your build configs. Then you have to connect everything with webhooks to make sure that, you know, when you do the commit, it goes ahead and, and uh, uh, starts the process. Um, you've got to uh, get your prod system to be able to pull the container. Uh, and then you need our back bindings for everything, right? Uh, and then our authorization groups on day two to figure out who has access to all this stuff. Uh, so it's a lot of different steps. It's not rocket science. You don't need a PhD in, in uh, uh, cloud native to be able to pull it off. Um, but it can feel like a bit of a Rube Goldberg machine sometimes. Uh, and so what I'm hoping to show here is that there are a lot of different ways that you can tame it. Um, and uh, hopefully uh, y'all will enjoy uh, this particular approach. Demo. So let's get to the fun part. All right, so first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to log in. Now, uh, I put the uh, URL for this project inside of the chat window. So first thing I'm going to do is log into my environment. Uh, this is a, a really basic, um, uh, uh, you know, kind of a straightforward implementation. Um, this is a variant on the OpenShift uh, uh, the, the OpenShift um, operator-based deployment that uh, is available on the web um, inside of our GitHub uh, repo. Uh, we added some things to it. So out of the box, our OpenShift repo just does uh, SSO for OpenShift and provisioning for OpenShift. Here we made it a bit more opinionated. So you can see that we've got these badges. Um, this is a, Think of this as a developer portal. This will adjust based on who has access to what. As a user, I can go, I can check out uh, what I have access to. I've got dynamic ability to request access to things. So here, you know, keep an eye on the bouncing ball. We're up to greetings three from my testing from setup. Um, this is all dynamic. So we'll see that this changes as the course of the demo goes through. And then finally, reports. We'll, we'll be able to see who did what. So let's start off with some table stakes and let's get into GitLab. So like I was saying uh, at the beginning of this, SSO, uh, but each of these applications have their own integrated identity. So being able to tie those together really brings a nice experience to the table. Uh, so I'm signed in now to, to uh, SonarCube. Uh, and then finally, let's go ahead and log into OpenShift. So first I'll log into our dev instance of OpenShift. And then I will log into our production instance of OpenShift. So we've got both of these instances going. I'll fire up projects and uh, Greetings in both of these, just to show there is nothing up my sleeve. This is uh, dev. So, uh, greetings. Okay, so uh, the first thing we're going to do is create a new project. Um, so, again, the self-service process, you know, we don't want to have to go into GitLab, create a project, create a project, create a project, link it all together. 
uh, that's that's pretty error prone. So we're going to go in. I'm going to say, hey, let's create a new project. I'm going to give it a name. Readings four, and uh, we're going to specify a type. So uh, this wasn't made a drop down. We have other customers where we built this out um, quite a bit more for their particular needs, where we did make these things drop downs uh, to make it a little bit simpler. Uh, and test. So it's going to say, I need a new application. The uh, the system approvers, however we define that, would have gotten a notification, hey, somebody wants to access something. So I'm going to go ahead and review this, give a reason, test. It's going to happen pretty quickly, so I want to show three projects, three projects, three projects. Let's go ahead and hit the button. I'm going to come over here. Hmm? Maybe. There's four projects. Greetings for test. There we go. Greetings for prod. If I come over here. There we go. Greetings for project. So uh, we've now provisioned projects in all three of our environments, our major environments, our, our OpenShift Dev, our OpenShift Prod, and GitHub, GitLab. We've also gone ahead and uh, integrated, uh, I think it's uh, settings, integrate, uh, no, webhooks. So we've already integrated the webhook for our, um, for our um, uh, pipeline to kick off our build config. So when somebody does a push, which we'll do here in a few minutes, uh, that will automatically kick off the build process. I'm going to come over to the uh, Jenkins project that we built. I'm in the wrong one. Here we go. And so if I come in here, we now have build configs for Greetings 4. And here's the, the two builds that we created. One is a more generic pipeline um, based on Jenkins. The other is a uh, S2I build. That will actually generate the image. And so uh, this particular workflow is embedded as, as kind of an initial workflow to just set everything up. We made a few assumptions here. You know, we're assuming that we're working in Java because uh, that's what we were told to work in. Um, and uh, we wanted to make it, uh, you know, as straightforward as possible. We're integrating our code analysis with SonarCube, um, generating the image using uh, OpenShift's built-in capabilities, tagging it, and then if we come back to our readings four, we have an image stream that's right now empty, waiting for an image because there's no code. And then the same thing over here in production. If we come to uh, our prod image, go to build, there's now an image stream that's waiting for a tag, that's waiting for an image. So now that we have uh, our projects been provisioned, it's been approved, uh, let's go ahead and push it all out. So. Uh, this is a pretty straightforward process. You know, it should look pretty familiar. Oops. All right, so let's go to uh, greetings three, and we're just going to go ahead and copy everything out. And 
before I hit get push, nothing in here. Now let's go ahead and go over to Jenkins. Wrong one again. We'll come over here to builds and keep an eye out. So everything's been pushed in, and there we can see we've all met, we've already kicked off our pipeline. Now this uh, UI should look pretty uh, pretty standard to pretty much anybody who's been working in OpenShift for a while. Um, and uh, so you know, containers spinning up, it's getting uh, you know. It's firing up a, a, a build container, so that'll take a moment or two. And while that's going, uh, you know, we come over here and we can see, you know, everything's in there. So we now have that push capable system. And so we've looked at the dev, we've looked at the ops. Ops hasn't actually done anything yet, which, which is kind of my favorite type of ops. Um, you know, from the security side, I come over here to my audit report. And let's look at the uh, change log for period. We'll zoom down here to the end. And we can see here is our greetings for application. Well, this was greetings three. Um, oh, wait, no, here we go, deploy application. So greetings four, and we can see every single object that we created across the multiple projects. We create objects in Kubernetes, we create objects in GitLab. Um, you know, we, we might have created objects inside of a database if we wanted to do that too, to track access management. But we can now tie together all of the different things that we created for this request back to this particular workflow. So now when someone says, where did this project come from? It's a report, it's a SQL query. It's not digging through logs, trying to tie everything together. Uh, or digging through emails. And then when it comes to, well, why? Why does this project even exist? We run a different report and we can see that it was created for reason test, right? You know, but this is the person who approved it. Um, so uh, I've actually got customers who are doing interesting things around like OPA, where, um, or I guess OPA is the right way to say it, uh, where if uh, a namespace or a project is not in the Open Unison database, um, they flag it and they'll say, uh, you know, somebody needs to uh, uh, tell us why this exists. Uh, so it gives you something to audit against, a known state or an expected state to audit against. Now let's take a look at our take a look at our pipeline. So we can see that uh, we've done. We've built the WAR, we've done the code analysis. So I take it if we refresh this, we'll now have greetings for found a vulnerability. Now, point of this demo wasn't really to, to say this is the best way to build a pipeline. So, um, you know, in reality, we'd have uh, different thresholds here for when Sonar Cube would, would say, no, this didn't work. Um, we're just using defaults right now. And so that process is building, and while that's going, I'm gonna go ahead and open this up in a new tab. Oh, and we can actually see that it tagged the image. So if I go over to our greetings for test, and I look at our image streams, bam, there's our image. So we have gone through the development side of things. We've, we've written our code, we've committed it, we've pushed it. Our security people are able to audit it. Uh, now it's time to move into production. We're going to come back here, and uh, we're going to come over to request access, and I want to deploy a project to production. Now you can see here we've got our greetings for application. This is a dynamic list that gets generated um, right at, we're querying the API server to see what projects are available. But what you don't see is the, you know, 30 or 40 uh, other projects that are just part of an OpenShift deployment, right? Um, and so that's because we're 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 doing it by label, and we're saying, you know, we we only want to see projects with a specific label. So when we provision these projects, we added the label to the project uh, to make sure that um, when it came 
when we came to this window, we only saw the projects that were in a position to provision. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and uh, add this to my cart, check out, now this is all API driven, so you could integrate this into whatever you'd like. And uh, we'll say demo. And so now that request has gone through, um, you know, the folks who are in charge that need to decide such things are going to hopefully be in a position to do it. And uh, and here we go, we have an open approval. Now this is gonna happen really quickly. So I'm going to uh, bring this up. So I'm in prod right now. There's no image tag, right? This is our production OC prod, our production environment. This is our test environment. So when I hit this button, we're gonna find that this tag ends up in here automatically. So I'm gonna hit confirm approval. And there it is. So if we take a look here, uh, 52C27F, 52C27F. So we've now gone through that whole life cycle where now it's up to OpenShift uh, and the deployment config to see, oh, new image stream. Let's go ahead and start rolling out things uh, based on, you know, however we configured it, A, B, you know, blue, green, whatever, um, all the different options that you have with OpenShift. And it's all been automated. I didn't use the OC command. Uh, you know, I, I was demoing things inside of the UI. I didn't actually have to go into the UI. Uh, as a developer, I never really had to go in there. I could use it as a, um, a staging ground to do some development and testing. Uh, but I wasn't forced to actually do anything inside of OpenShift to, to get things going. Um, and uh, I was able to maintain my existing business processes. Um, you know, as the ops person, I didn't have to, you know, go in and manually create things. Uh, as the dev, I was able to do my job. And then finally, as the security person, I had access to all the different reports and automation needed to be able to assure the executives, yeah, the environment's secured and we're following best practices and our compliance guidelines. Uh, so like I said, the code is on GitHub. Um, it's not a, a, a turnkey solution, but I think it's a decent enough starting point anyway. Um, everything is open source, so it's right there on GitHub. Uh, pull requests, suggestions, rants, all accepted. Uh, we, we, we love to talk and interact with folks, so whatever your thoughts are, we'd love to hear it. Um, yeah, so with that, I'll open it up to questions. Hi, well, thanks for that. I, it's it's been like DevSecOps month here. We've done, <laughs> I, it seems to be top of mind to somehow conjoin all of these conversations across um, organizations, the dev folks, the security folks, and the ops folks. And I think this is kind of a, a nice um, segue because whenever I see, uh, see you, I always think of you as the pragmatic person. You're the person that actually goes out and implements it. I'm the person that uh, like, oh, bleeding edge, cutting edge, this is like, do this stuff. And and you're really kind of down there in the trenches making this work for people who are deploying OpenShift and deploying apps and stuff like that. So uh, I, I'm i really um, thrilled to have you here with that kind of pragmatic approach to things, making the SonicCube and, and Jenkins and everything else work together very nicely. It's really, I totally appreciate this perspective. One of the, the conversations that um, that I was having last week that kind of struck me is, is, is that we've been talking so much about security and compliance and audits is how to talk to um, and explain all of this to your compliance people. Right? So it's this, these systems, and you, you, you said the point, it was not Rubik's Cube, um, Rube Goldberg. Um, and when you when you bring this stuff to um, uh, the audit team and the IT audit folks, and a lot of like a lot of them don't know what containers are, and, and a lot of a lot of them are new to Kubernetes, and a lot and some of them are new to OpenShift. Um, or uh, how, how do you um, work with with those folks to get them up to speed and to trust? Um, all, I mean, I know you are all about trust and the identity management and stuff like that. So you've got a lot of uh, background working with compliance people. 
how how is your what's your experience or what's your coaching on on bringing explaining this stuff we get it because we're developers or some of you guys are ops people or maybe you're security people but it's the compliance officers who often like look at this and go well this is just spaghetti or you know rube goldberg where's where's my audit report where's how do i trust that all of this stuff is working in the sink that's a great question um and you know it's really buzzwordy but culture understanding the culture right so we you know there's this constant theme devops devsecops it's culture it's a two-way culture though it's not just you need to understand how to do devsecops mm -hmm. but devsecops has to understand how everybody else does their job too so when you go to the compliance person you know for better or worse the compliance person they have a language that they speak um and and so while not directly related to security um, in a past life as a consultant, I, I was a, a project management professional. And I was on a project where I was told walking into it that the, um, the manager from the company I was working for and the project manager from the customer hated each other, absolutely despised each other. That's always every, so helpful. That's so that's helpful. so helpful. And every meeting devolved into a shouting match. Like, oh, this is going to be fun. And so I walked in, and after one meeting, I realized what the problem was. The customer project manager was a PMP, and she was saying everything in PMP speak. And the, the company's project manager was not a PMP. He was a good manager, but he, just, he wasn't a PMP. So he was just using different language. And so I sat there, and I spent two hours just being like, well, no, this is an input of this, and, I, and just translating it. Yeah. And by the end of it, they were like best of friends because they, they realized that they were talking each other's language. They, you know, they were just saying it differently. And so when you go to the compliance officer or you go to the compliance group, um, you know, you've got to, it is a two-way street. There should be, you know, a good compliance group is gonna to come to where you or you live, but you also gotta to go to them where they live. And so they're, they're looking at spreadsheets. They're looking at controls. They're looking at, you know, here is our compliance framework. We have to use NIST 853. We have to use PCI. We have to, you know, and, and so it's, it's really important to be able to tie back to those things and just make it as easy as possible for people to say yes. Um, you know, about the worst thing you can do is walk in and be like, well, of course it's secure. Don't you see that? Yeah. Um, it, you know, it, 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 so the, the, being able to speak that language at both sides is really where you're going to find your success. Yeah, yeah, no, I think that that's that's key. I think the language thing is a really big part of it, and a lot of um, a, a lot of the security now is kind of baked in as well. It's like you can't deploy it unless it's secure in, in some ways. Like the container has been scanned and all of these things, and there's a lot of a lot more automation than like 10 years ago or so when I I was doing. Oh yeah. IT audit stuff and but they still I, I tend to get requests for things like where's my you know show me the log file show me the audit report and, and I think some of that you've got baked into open unison and, and tremolo security so I've, I've been pretty impressed with being able to get um, good reporting and good explanations out of some of the like all, all of the Kubernetes um, platforms, but especially some of the identity management stuff. I think you hit the nail on the head when you talked about three different identity management systems going into one pipeline, you know, and, and how do you merge all of these different approaches to identity management. And, and I think that's the sweet spot for, for Tremolo uh, is being able to do that, which is wonderful and which is why we're so happy you're part of our ecosystem. <clears throat> and, um, excuse me. Drink a little more coffee out of my red hat swag. <laughs> we, we were talking about swag earlier today, and uh, it was kind of funny because it's like, do we miss swag? How do we distribute swag I, in the in the time of COVID? And 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 Mark, if you're listening, um, has said earlier is like, you know, I'm so glad, almost glad there is no more swag. And yeah, this but this cup is, you know, this is and these these, these shirts are, are pretty pretty <laughs> rocking awesome. But we have enough of them now. So. <laughs> No, actually, like, go, let's go back a little bit to this, too, because one of the wonderful things about Open Unison is that it is open source. And you mentioned um, your decision to turn Open Unison into an open source project or make all of the code available open source came back um, in 2015. 
when you were at uh, a Red Hat summit, and you you probably drank in thirteen, yeah, two thousand thirteen. <laughs> probably drank some Kool Aid from Red Hat at that event. What what was the thing that really um, inspired you to to move this into an open source one? I mean, was it at our our awesome business model, or uh, was it just what was it that got to you? So it was a few things. I mean, I've been doing open source literally since I got into programming. Um, my first job was from open source, uh, my very first job out of college and how I got into identity management. Um, I had posted a project on, uh, I'll date myself here a little bit, SourceForge. And, um, oh, yeah, I remember I was, <laughs> <laughs> and I was still in college at the time. And like, it was just like on paper, some stuff around LDAP for, for uh, uh, another project I was doing. And uh, the startup said, hey, uh, can we pay you to do it? Sure. And then they hired me after after school and, and the rest, as they say, was history. But I mean, I've I've been doing open source my entire career. So uh, open source has always been really important to me, um, not just as a, um, you know, as, as a way to getting into the code, but just kind of part of me. Um, and so uh, when we started Tremolo, we were not originally an open source company. Um, and uh, there are a lot of reasons for that. Uh, we tried some freemium stuff and, and didn't get a lot of traction there. And then I went to Red Hat Summit at Boston, I think it was 2013. And I was just kind of taken back by the community and just how like a little of it was Kool-Aid, a little of it was just like the the getting caught up in the in the moment but just the enthusiasm that people had around open source. Um, and then I kind of came to a bit of a business epiphany as well, where I realized there are people that no matter how cheap the code is, I could charge a penny for this, they won't pay it. And then there are enterprises that I could charge a million dollars for this, or they could pay, use it for free without support. They won't use it for free without support. Yeah, And so uh, I came to the realization that while my, oh, and I call them my open source customers because I treat them as customers, um, don't give me money, they give me feedback. That's they huge. they, they yeah, tell me what's fight. going on. Yeah. It, it's it's huge. I can't, you know, I, I'd have to go through Git, you know, Git, uh, GitHub to quantify it, but you know, the number of things where people have said, hey, um, now that this is in our environment, can you explain this better in the documentation? Documentation's huge, like feedback on documentation. If, if you're a user of open source, please, feedback on documentation is the single most important thing you can contribute to a project, because documentation is every bit, if not harder than the code itself. Um, but, you know, or, you know, this feature doesn't really work for us, or, you know, hey, I had a problem doing this. You know, that feedback is, is gold yeah. because then when you go to the people who are going to pay for it you just want it to work right the first time mm -hmm. and so having the ability to have somebody have beaten on it for a couple of minutes beforehand that's yeah. not you yeah. huge it's invaluable yeah. um and so we kind of came to that realization so at uh i think it was red hat summit 2015 uh was when we actually came out of stealth mode and that was our first red hat summit our first conference um our first major conference, um, that's when we were like, nope, we're open sourcing everything. And then uh, uh, it was strange. We never made so much money as when we gave everything away. Yeah, yeah Peter, Peter Larson just put, you know, one of my favorite, um, given enough eyes, every bug is shallow. It, it, it is, I think, the mantra there too. And it's also, you can't pay money to get that kind of feedback, uh, you know. No. Or, we're doing work now, like on in, in the OKD working group, uh, which everybody should um, watch. And, and it's doing two things. One, it's really working out a lot of the bugs in in OpenShift, um, and it, you know, creating a wonderful. I, I call it a playground. People probably resent calling it play, but um, a wonderful space for um, also testing Fedora CoreOS because the OKD runs on that. So it's like this yep. cross collaboration between two communities and the Fedora folks are putting all this time and energy on um, improving the bleeding edge of, of RHEL and Linux, as well as 
the OKD folks are really pushing the envelope in terms of making Fedora do amazing things. And what you just see is like all of these extra eyeballs on something that normally maybe we um, push out a release of OKD um, as just part of the pipeline process for um, for OpenShift. You know, every release we'd throw something in the in the past into the origin repo, and there you'd have it. Um, but now this the extra sets of eyeballs that are working on it, uh, and uh, I'm personally not paying them. Um, other people might be <laughs> paying them, but I, I'm not paying them, and it's it's just huge, uh, I think. And one of one of the wonderful things, and I think that's also the thing the neat thing about Open Unison as well uh, is that you get. You know, you do get the paying customers because you know you still are you, you are dressing in swag, but I I, I do see that <laughs> you, know, you know you're doing quite well, and we're really happy for you for that. But one of the things that's lovely about Tremolo Security is if if you're ever on um, the OpenShift Commons Slack channel, and if you're not there now, just join. Go to open uh, commons.openshift.org and fill out the join screen and and do the join process, and we'll put you in there. But Mark is there almost all the time. I, mean, I think you have it set up to notify you. That's why you get that little twitch when you um, <laughs> slap around that too. And, and, and people like Mark are, are always um, sharing the lessons learned, coaching people on how to do stuff. And it, it's really pretty amazing. Um, we have about 545, probably if I got updated today, probably about 550 different member organizations in Commons. And I'm always, every day, surprised and so grateful for um, the contributions. And a lot of it is just feedback and coach peer-to-peer -peer coaching and, and people showing up um, for sessions like this, whether they're internal Red Hatters who are on their lunch hour, because if on your East Coast right now, this is kind of your lunch hour. <laughs> if, you're on, if you're on the West Coast like I am, it's like your second cup of coffee hour. And, um, and we, we need more, um, but it's it's really people's spare time, and 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 spare is is not free time. It's you know you're giving us um, your time and energy to help improve the products, the the code, and um, people's understanding of um, Open Unison identity management. I have learned from Mark like so much about that I didn't really think about, about identity management, about all these different pipelines, different air arenas, all how to bring all these things together and bridge these um, different identity management um, systems together. And, uh, you know, and then to have you come in and, and talk about DevSecOps is like, yeah, okay, that just makes sense. But it's only because of our conversations in these um, areas of collaboration and, and that, that I know to ask you to come in and do these things. So it's, Really, open source kind of changes things for a lot of people and, and for a lot of organizations, and it's wonderful, wonderful to have you here doing that. So tell me, uh, and then, so we've blathered on about open source and how wonderful it is. Tell me what's next um, for Tremolo Security. What's coming out the pipeline in your roadmap? So we're doing some interesting stuff. Um, we're really starting to take a focus on. Uh, a lot of like what you've seen here around automating of pipelines and automating your build out. Um, uh, I'm actually also in the process of writing a book, which is a lot of fun. Oh, um, me too. No, it's not a lot. Of fun. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a really good co-author, so that makes it fun. Okay. Um, so we're we're writing a book on Kubernetes, and uh, my side of it might surprise you. It's a focus on identity management um, and automation, and so uh, that that's been a, a, a fun process as well. So so that's going on, uh, and then. Um, we're ch kind of chugging through on trying to productize stuff like this a little bit more to make it easier. So uh, like our GitLab integration, making that simpler. Um, you know, we've got a couple of customers that have built things with us uh, that are similar to this, not this exact same implementation, but similar process. So taking that and making it easier, um, easier to integrate uh, and, and quicker to get off the, you know, go from what my opinion is of a, a pipeline. Whoops. We just lost your voice. Oh, can you hear oh, me? Now I can hear you, just for a nice. Oh, okay. So that was weird. You're, you're um, at your opinion of and stop. Oh, yeah, so I was saying, you know, uh, 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 
you know, trying to make it easier to get from what my opinion of a system or a platform might be to what your reality is. And, and, and you know, I'll, I'll never have the, the right opinion, right? But we can, we can work on getting that gap shorter and shorter and shorter or easier and easier to get to. Um, one of the things that, that never ceases to amaze me, I, you know, before I started Tremolo, uh, I spent over a decade as a consultant uh, and, you know, um, uh, all the different organizations I go to, you know, some in the same uh, uh, industry, some across industries, some different countries, how everybody has the same goal in their enterprise and they all need to get there in slightly different ways. And those slight different ways are where you spend all your time and money. And mm -hmm. so that, that's really where we want to attack is to say, how do we make those slight changes which end up translating to huge budget costs uh, a lot easier? Make it, making a project extensible with for the edge cases is really one of the tricks um, of things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Plug in and, and and in some ways, um, like Kubernetes is, is pretty is a good example. And along OpenShift is Kubernetes. So, but the the whole operator model too, is allowing people to extend uh, the platform without having to make it a feature in Kubernetes. And so I think some of the the way we um, use the operator pattern has helped um, a lot. And, and you, one of the things that you've done is, is create that an operator for, for Open Unison. Yeah, it, it's really, um, it's really kind of an interesting shift in the way we've done our deployments. Um, so one of the things that makes Open Unison a little bit unique is that it's part infrastructure, part business application. Identity management often maps to to, Both to your enterprise's business processes, uh, and on the infrastructure side. Uh, what makes um, uh, what's always made the Open Unison deployment process uh, a, a little bit harder in the past was certificates. Like we mm -hmm. just, you know, we have to talk to directories, we got to talk to SAML providers, we got to talk, you know, all these different things we need to talk to. All those different APIs that we talked about, you know, back here, that's a certificate, that's a certificate, that's a certificate, that's a certificate, you know, all these different systems, right? Um, and so, uh, Managing that certificate building process, um, when combined with the fact that we're built on Java and nobody likes to deal with Java key stores, uh, you know, was really painful. So we we started off with, you know, okay, well, just here's the documentation on how to do it. And um, one of our open source users uh, wrote this, like, immensely detailed document. It was, like, 30 pages long of how we got it running. And I was like, that is the most shameful thing I have ever read. <laughs> I am ashamed that you felt you needed to write that. To like, I'm thankful that you did it, but oh my God, I'm gonna go crawl under a rock because I made something that was that hard to deploy. So we built a, a deployer and we said, okay, we wanted to build this thing that would deploy artifacts for us. Um, and so we built that and it worked, except day two didn't work. And this was about the time uh, the core OS acquisition and operators started to become a thing. And we said, well, we could do, build that into an operator. And so we took the, and, and we had another customer at the time who it went from 30 pages down to like 10. And it's like, okay, well, this has gotten better. Still not acceptable, but better. And then we said, okay, let's go with the operator model. And, and so we moved that artifact deployment bit into an operator. And we found that our deployment process went from, you know, 10 pages to two pages. You know, it, it really dropped it down. It made it much more flexible for how we deployed the operator. Um, there's still, a, a, I would say, quite a bit to be settled around the operator process. Um, we're still kind of figuring out what the happy medium is to what goes into a CR versus what goes into a, um, a uh, um, uh, uh, you know, the uh, Kubernetes native objects and OpenShift native objects. Um, but it, it's definitely changed the way we approach. Wow. We totally appreciate the efforts that you've made. You've been on the bleeding edge of a lot of the um, different steps on our path uh, from OpenShift from the early days till now. And um, this has sort of been um, a wonderful thing to, um, to watch 
um, the rise of tremolo security and um, the appreciation for the work that you do in identity management and helping um, others understand it better. And so I really encourage everybody to go out and um, give a look at Open Unison, um, give some feedback to it, um, come on to the OpenShift uh, Slack channel, uh, come to commons.openshift.org and um, join up and we'll put you in there and, and you can always find Mark or wake him up, depending on the time zone, and <laughs> get Slack notification on um, and make him tweet. And we will definitely be having him back here again. So please do um, reach out to him and um, join us um, again tomorrow. We'll be back again tomorrow with, uh, tomorrow's going to be a talk on Tekton from Peter Clank over at IBM. He's going to give an update on um, what's going on in the world of Tekton, um, a demo of how to deploy it on IBM Cloud, and um, pretty much take a look at the Tekton roadmap and again, have a bit of a AMA on Tekton with some other folks from IBM and Red Hat um, after that um, short talk by Peter Klink. So um, as always, Mark, we are totally grateful for all your contributions and all your efforts. And though we couldn't see you at the virtual uh, Red Hat Summit in person, it was wonderful to, to be part of that with you and um, someday soon. We will see you again in person, hopefully, and um, maybe KubeCon North America in Boston. So um, uh, that'd be nice. Go out and get some lobster and, uh, <laughs> and have a nice dinner and um, talk with our Boston accents. So I may be in Canada, but I'm originally from there. So when I want to, I can talk like that. So um, but I've got my Canadian accent on today. So thanks again, everybody, for joining us. Thanks, Mark, for taking the time today and adjusting your calendar for us. Uh, and Chris Short, as always, thank you for producing this and making this happen. So um, we'll sign off now and I will post the, the demo portion of this along with some of the resource links um, on our uh, blog at openshift.com as well as um, post the, the YouTube video up on RH OpenShift on YouTube. But the whole raw feed will always be there on Twitch as well. So there are lots of options for finding this content, but most of all, go to tremolo.io and um, check out the good work that, that Mark and his team are doing in the open. All right, take care, Mark. Have a wonderful day. Bye, Diane. Thanks again. Bye-bye.